Substitute teacher approval. Um, Althea already uploaded the change, but we need to uh, put it, uh, when you make your motion about approving the agenda, it needs to be approval of the agenda as amended. So whoever decides to make that motion. I'll move to approve the agenda as amended for March 18, 2013, regular meeting. Thank you. The motion in the second, all in favor by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Can we go back to the approval of the agenda? That was the consent agenda. That was the consent agenda. Oh, okay. Which includes the. Okay. Okay. Moved it from the consent agenda. I was just presented. Okay, I have a motion in the second, all in favor by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. I'm sorry, I was listening. Okay, next we have public participation. Okay, we'll move on to the report of the superintendent. Yes, you'll notice that we have some notes of appreciation. Uh, we've had, uh, again, a, a difficult month for some of our school family. So uh, take note of that. We do have our annual school board election uh, right around the corner now, April 2nd. I, I know that because I've seen all the signs mushrooming up around town. And uh, we do have four people who are running for the school board. We have the incumbent, Mr. Terry McDaniel. And we have with us tonight all three of our uh, others. Uh, Mr. Larry Fall is over there, Mr. Rick Rudloff, and Mr. John Wood Sr. So thank you all for being here tonight, and we wish you the best. Um, we have kindergarten registration coming up this Saturday at St. John Elementary. And uh, Colleen and I are getting a little nervous because our numbers for sign up are not very large. So if you're waiting to the last minute, folks, <laughs> it's almost here. So come on and sign up. Uh, in two weeks, then we'll have Bloomsdale Elementary uh, sign up. So uh, don't, have, don't feel like you have to wait. Go ahead and call. Lori's waiting out there at Bloomsdale. She, she will take your call and get you scheduled. So. Um, we have our testing schedule there, as you see, and uh, our annual banquet will be May the 3rd out at the Elks Lodge, and uh, that will start at 6 o'clock. Um, we have wonderful entertainment uh, that will include uh, some of our staff present tonight. I believe Mr. Mercer's uh, group is kindly providing the, uh, the music for us over there so we sure hope everybody uh, can attend and uh, all retirees of our district and and their spouses are most welcome to attend that uh, we will be sending out letters to that effect but just in case we miss you and don't happen to have your address or something please call us get us that address we'll send you a letter but feel free, feel free to attend May 3rd 6 o'clock uh, you'll notice under safety issues that we have a variety of uh, drills that were held uh, some changes that were noted by the principals, a few items that they're going to handle and take care of um, as they've noted going through the uh, drills. Okay? The last thing I wanted to point out, you'll remember, it's been a while back now, we talked about the mural in the uh, gymnasium hallway and um, we felt that that was the best place to put the Hall of Fame. Okay? So we didn't know what in the world was the best thing to do with the mural. Um, so we contacted the young people who had worked on that, as many as we could uh, find, and mostly got, hey, it's all right, we knew when we painted it that that you know, it might not be forever. And uh, at that time I suggested to them, what if we had it photographed, framed, and put back up on the wall? And they, that seemed to be acceptable. And so I uh, uh, asked Mr. Otto to work on that project <coughs> for me. And so he went down there and photographed that. I believe he told me that there, that's actually 10 individual shots 
that he then photoshopped together because that was a curved surface down there and so to get it looking right and not anything looking out of proportion and whatnot, he did a lot of work on that. Mr. Jett uh, made the frame and I uh, believe uh, maybe Mr. Otto or Mr. Cook some cut the mat and so it's been, a, it's been a school community project and it came out beautifully. So uh, we will be hanging that back in the lobby down there at the gymnasium. Uh, but I wanted you all to see it uh, before I took it down there. So. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Oh, we'll have uh, Vanna and Pat. Uh, <laughs> I'm Pat. <laughs> Vanna, you've had a haircut. Yeah, to say the least. <laughs> but that's really sharp looking, and, and I think it definitely does justice to the students' artwork, and, and I really appreciate Mr. Otto and Mr. Jett and, and all of those who had a hand in, in making that happen. Yes. Are you? Yeah. Everybody have a technical No, just me. No. I'm sorry. Can I, is there anything I can help you with? I don't know. <laughs> Someone obviously needs to help me. Cannot prepare a request. These are not logged in. Okay, our tech guy is Mr. Haney. Mr. Haney, you got any suggestions? <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> I was in there today, but not here in there today. Sorry, that's all right. You can continue on. I start to say it. Do you want us to wait? We'll, we'll be glad to do so. <coughs> that's the end of my comments, though, uh, Ms. Reese. Okay. Does anyone have any comments, questions? Yeah. Okay. We'll move on to unfinished business. First is graduation, setting the day. Yes, indeed. Graduation slash uh, last day of school. <laughs> um, as, as I had talked about with our uh, St. Jen NEA, I uh, am with you all. I did uh, poll the staff on the variety of different possibilities. We had three days to make up, and um, we offered to them the idea of putting all three of them at the end of the school year, um, or a variety of combinations of some days on Easter break and some days at the end of the school year. And, and you can see the staff survey is, on, is in your board packet. 43.9% uh, of the staff who responded, and we had 205 responses. And, and actually, I sent this out, I believe, to all faculty and staff. Ever, anybody who wanted to could vote. Um, 205 responses. 90 of those said put all three days at the end of the school year in May. Uh, so that would be May 20, 21, and 22 with the teacher work day on May 23. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, teacher work day on Thursday. Um, that being the most popular uh, option with our staff and, and seeming to make sense to all of us, uh, Mr. Haney and I uh, talked about what were the best options for graduation. Um, of course, you have so many things that happen right at that time in May. You have track. Uh, sectional track is the weekend of the 18th. State track would be the following weekend, which is also Memorial Day weekend. So, in other words, there are no good answers. <laughs> but um, Mr. Haney and I discussed it. We feel very strongly that going ahead with graduation on May the 18th would be a positive way to go. Um, the seniors will take their finals on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week. They will take their uh, work day slash barbecue uh, on that Thursday and have graduation practice on that Friday and then graduate on Saturday the 18th uh, at 8 o'clock. There is sectional track. It's, at, uh, it's in St. Louis this year. Um, so they're only uh, maybe a little more than an hour away. Um, the last, mi last match we said was at 5.30, yes, 5.30 start. Yes, so, you know, we'll, we'll do what we need to depending on who all we have in that and, and if we maybe need to a little bit later say we're going to start a little later. We, we've done that before as well. Uh, so uh, our recommendation is that we approve makeup days on May 20, 21, and 22, teacher work day on May 23, and graduation on May 18. I guess the only thing I left out of that is that underclassmen would return on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to take their finals. Let 
but the following weekend it would be the state track, and that's right. Priority. That's worse, so that's yeah. And Memorial Day, and, and, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's even worse. Yeah, because we had uh, one suggestion that maybe we uh, take a couple of three-day weekends, um, you know, a couple of extra days between now and the end of the year, and go that full week and have graduation that weekend. But when you do that, you're hitting state track on that Saturday, and then you're into Memorial Day weekend. And we have graduated that way before. It's not impossible to do. It just seemed that if we could avoid it, it, it would be better. And state track, of course, being in Jeff City, they're farther away, and just that much more than them <coughs> trying to get back. So. so that, does that mean that the spring break will be Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'll make a motion. Oh. I move to approve makeup days on May 20th, 21st, and 22nd, 2013. Teacher work day on May 23rd, 2013, and graduation on Saturday, May 18th, 2013, at 8 p.m. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor by saying aye. 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 Okay. Okay. Okay, next is the estimated tax rate. Uh, trying to give you a little background on this, uh, in 07, the state passed a law that required county assessors to give estimated uh, assessments out by March of each year, and uh, that public entities approve a non-binding estimated tax rate for the upcoming year by April of each year. Um, for our county, this was implemented two, two years ago, except that the state never did come up with software that the assessors could use that would actually allow them to do this in a timely fashion. And so in their, in their wisdom, they gave the assessors the permission not to do that without giving the taxing entities permission not to set an estimated levy. And so uh, I think this is kind of a technicality and probably there would be no problem if we didn't do it, but I don't want to risk the 20% uh, penalty if we don't. So I simply have sent the, have uh, created the attached letter that uh, gives our estimated rates the same as our current, and uh, this is non-binding, but it is an estimate. So. We do this every year. Okay. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Move to approve the attached letter to the county clerk as presented. Second. Okay, have a motion and a second. All in favor by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is the report of the Educate EduSafe report. Yes, uh, Dennis Lewis, who was here before, uh, did our review and uh, the quite lengthy analysis of our district uh, has sent us this report, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lindsay to uh, give you some of the highlights. You all have the entire report, so um, I know you've had a chance to look at that. Dr. Lindsay's not going to read to you, but he'll kind of review it. Uh, basically, what, what I want to do is just kind of give a brief summary of the plan. Uh, you can read it in, in detail uh, as you wish and kind of describe the next steps as we move forward in the process. Um, it's organized a little bit differently in the, in the plan and the way I'm going to do it. Um, I kind of want to focus in two areas and one being sort of physical, tangible uh, recommendations and then the other one being more procedural. Uh, recommendations. So with physical recommendations, uh, just to hit some of the, the highlights uh, of the plan, uh, some of the recommendations that he had were to limit or restrict access where feasible to both exterior and interior doors. Um, talked about a whole double gated uh, entry process uh, into the various buildings with some sort of a office check-in process before they uh, before visitors to the school have access to common areas. Um, use of additional cameras uh, in selected areas. Uh, consideration of panic alarms or panic buttons of some sort uh, in the main offices in each building. Um, talked about reviewing the intercom system to ensure that all areas were covered, uh, that announcements can be heard uh, in the event that there's some sort of a situation that comes up. Uh, and then uh, also talked about utilizing safety best practices for new construction or renovation. That's kind of a recommendation that's looking toward the future and, and when there's new construction or renovation in the district to, uh, to always keep in mind what the latest uh, best practices are with respect to uh, uh, school safety. 
Uh, also talked about uh, exploring options for a school resource officer, uh, maybe looking uh, for grant funding that may be out there uh, with regard to that. As far as procedural recommendations, uh, recommended some changes to the emergency response plan. Um, one thing was the inclusion of photos of critical areas, um, common hallways, uh, major rooms, you know, like the commons area, that, that sort of thing. Um, talked about dividing the, the emergency response plan to a certain extent between critical pages, those that you need to access quickly uh, in the event of some, some sort of situation, and then reference pages uh, that provide some of the background and, and the more detailed uh, information that you might refer to in a more casual sense as opposed to in the midst uh, uh, of a crisis. Um, and then also uh, recommended a consistent format for, for building and district level plans. Some of the format's consistent now, but some of it is, is uh, uh, a little bit inconsistent. So if you're moving from building to building uh, and looking at the plans, uh, sometimes it's a little hard to find something because it's in a different place or, or it's just set up a little, a little bit different. Um, talked about uh, reviewing the, the number, type, and timing of emergency drills. Um, that we conduct. Um, as you know, we, we meet all the state guidelines and actually exceed those with respect to our emer emergency drills. Uh, but uh, uh, talked about doing uh, maybe some that's a, a little more unconventional, like when everyone's at lunch or when there's an assembly. Those kinds of things that we're not used to. We usually schedule those so that they're somewhat convenient. They don't disrupt uh, things uh, any more than you have to. But occasionally we, we may need to, to sprinkle in one of those that uh, uh, would see how, how we react in, in a situation that's not a normal uh, kind of situation. Uh, talked about additional staff and student training on emergency response. Um, and then also uh, talked about uh, periodic audits of classroom emergency supplies. I think there was some inconsistency uh, in having those emergency supplies available. Um, Kind of the next steps in the process, uh, the report has already been shared with the District Safety Committee and a meeting's been planned for next Tuesday, a week from tomorrow, um, at 3.30 in, in this room. And a couple of you are, are on the committee, so I'll you receive that, uh, that email. Uh, Keith Schweiss is also in the process of putting some cost estimates together uh, for many of the fiscal recommendations because many of those do require uh, some sometimes significant cost for those. So he's working on trying to, to put together some numbers even though there's still a lot of unknown right now is exactly where you might put a camera and that affects to a certain extent the cost. Um, and then once the committee has, has reviewed those, uh, we would like for them to uh, make a prioritized recommendation and uh, the administration will review that and the plan is to present that information uh, to you all at the Board, uh, Board of Education meeting in April. Do um, you have any questions at this point? Do you have any input uh, you'd like to provide as we move forward? I think you guys done, or they've done, he's, they've done a great job. Mm -hmm. I mean, for what our facility is, I've just done a great job. Pretty good. Most, yeah. yeah. Very yeah. thorough. I thought he had some good suggestions and at yes. least uh, very thought-provoking for the committee to, mm -hmm. to look at. I've always been very impressed with his knowledge level. Um, sure. mm -hmm. I like the fact that he's he's got law enforcement background right. that mm -hmm. makes him look at things a different way than we look at it as educators. Right. So that's a good thing. You said that uh, Keith Weiss was looking at some of the cost factors, and including possible camera placement. Uh, then that those cost factors would go back to the assessment team and then they would prioritize what we put in motion? Is that the way you said that? Well, what we would like to do is, is when we have our meeting next Tuesday with the District Safety Committee, we want to have some numbers there just to get a feel for you know whether this is a, uh, is this a $500 item or is this a $10,000 item. Uh, and, you know, things like key card access or, um, you know, if, you know camera system with the uh, door buzzer, kind of like, what's it, Bloomsdale, 
it, we just wanted to get a feel for the kind of cost involved with those particular uh, uh, kinds of recommendations that were in the report uh, so that we can have a more informed discussion uh, with the district safety committee uh, and, and should help them as far as prioritizing uh, to a certain extent and then obviously will we'll help uh, the board uh, moving forward with making, making decisions from there. So in the decision process as to what we put in place based upon the assessment teams finding out after Mr. Schweiss does all the cost factors, then we'll say, uh, shall we say, set a limit or agree upon how much we will implement? What, what I would see you all doing um, is taking a look at the list of recommendations because Dr. Lindsay and I kind of have envisioned things that the committee deems priority one, we've got to do this, this is, these, are, these are high priority critical items, and then to prioritize within that group. You know, this is like the very first thing we, we really recommend that this is important, okay? And go down in that group, and then create a group that's, you know, once we get those things in place, this is kind of like really important step two, and then this would be maybe when we get our bond issue next time, or you know, so they're they're maybe not as mission critical, or they are so costly that we would have to uh, we'd have to make a, a plan for the funding of it before we could even say we're going to do it. And so, what I would envision you all doing is is saying, okay, we look at this list and we may agree with the prioritization or we may not. You all may not. You may say, no, you know, I really think item three is way more important than item one. I don't know what you I don't know what you all were thinking. And which is fine. You know, the committee understands that, that you'll be making the final decision as to which things to implement and in what order that we implement them. And so um, we'll take a look at that and say uh, you know, I'll, I'll have information, we have information about our current budget and you know, these are items that I think we could go ahead and do before the end of this year. Uh, these items I'll build into the budget for next year. You all tell me how many of these items you want me to put in the budget for next year and, and we'll get started on those July 1. You know, so that's kind of how I see that playing out unless you all have a better, better idea of, it, of a different way you want to do it. So it sounds like this could be, even though some of these things, the things that you may be thinking of may not be in this uh, assessment package here, it's going to be ongoing for years. Or always be oh yeah, and changing I think this is a long-term plan. I do. I see this as a long-term plan. Especially if there's any new additions or anything. Right, because some of it, as as uh, Dennis Lewis pointed out in his, in his uh, evaluation here, some of these are for future construction or renovation. You know, if we if we decide that we are going to do a major renovation of uh, the middle school entry area, well then we would look at, at these things, you know. Um, so it, it'll help us, I think, in our CSIP process planning. Uh, when, we, when we start prioritizing, we put those things in that for the next five years and you know, down the road. So, yeah, it's a long-term plan. Some of it will be immediate. Some of it will be next year. Some of it will be, you know, maybe a little longer than that. And that was not anything you have to take action on. That was just informational. Mm -hmm. okay. Next, we'll move on to new business. First is health insurance. Uh, yes, the um, mineral area... Uh, health Insurance Consortium, uh, we have been a part of now for, um, well, let's see, I think we've got our history in here. Uh, since 05, I believe, we have uh, spent several years now, and it's been very solid, it's been very beneficial to us as a district. It helps when you're in a consortium of uh, a thousand lives, it, it helps you, um, you know, instead of 200 lives, no one individual has a, a huge impact on the group like they would if you were in a small group. So it helps to level out when there's large impact items. And so this has been very important to us, has been a, a, a very helpful to us financially, okay? Um, so each, about every two years, the consortium asks Wall Street, who is our uh, third-party broker, uh, asked Wall Street to bid out 
uh, our coverage to see if you know what else what else is out there in the market. Uh, we've been with Anthem now for um, uh, well, we were with Anthem for two years, and then we've been with UHC now for four four years. So we decided it was time to look and see what else was out there. What seems to be the best right now, the best bid that we got back in, is uh, from, from Coventry. Uh, Coventry is um, um, actually, it's a, um, let's see, when uh, GHP and um, Mercy Insurance, when they merged, they created Coventry, okay? Um, been very stable and is a very well highly thought of company. Uh, is and several of our uh, neighboring, well, variety of our neighboring districts, including Arcadia Valley, who's not currently in our consortium. They've been with Coventry, and they want to now. If we're going to go to Coventry as a group, they would like to be a part of. It. They feel like it's been that positive for them. Long and short of it is, they could match our exact plans. There'll be a little variance in the drug cards and, to, you know, something's in Tier 2 instead of Tier 3 or Tier 3 instead of Tier 2. And so there are going to be a, a few little disruptions like that, but they're trying to minimize those as much as possible and let people know as far in advance. But with only a 0.5% increase, that's the thing that, that is critical to remember. Um, UHC started out with a 12% increase. Um, Wall Street went back to them and said, hey, you know, you're, way, you're way above where other things are coming in, and can you try again? They came back and said, well, we think we might can do 8%, but we probably have to change some things about your plan. And uh, then Coventry was so strong that uh, they, they could see they were about to lose us, and so UHC said, well, you know, if we change this and this, we could get down to 5% increase. Well, you're still not in the ballpark when Coventry is doing the exact same plan for half a percent increase. And really and truly, they would have, it would have been a 1.75% drop except for uh, the new federal health care law that requires a 2.25% tax be added onto that. And so, with that additional tax added in, it's still only a half percent increase to us. So uh, took this to the insurance committee. Uh, Joe, our Wall Street gal, came and presented uh, all the information to our committee. They felt very comfortable that this was the right way to go. The kicker on this is that we have a uh, cap on the increases that can happen to us in year two if we choose to stay with Coventry, which we are not required to as a consortium. If, if we hate it, six months from now we can say, no, sorry, we, we can't do it. We're going to switch to something else. It's very disruptive and, and not recommended. <laughs> but if it's that bad, we can do that. Um, so we don't have to stay with them for the second year. But if we do, um, you have a letter in here where they have guaranteed us some rate caps depending on our loss, loss ratio. And um, currently we're at a 85% uh, I believe loss ratio. So uh, that would give us a very small increase but not anything like it could be. Because uh, if, you, you know, if you think about UHC wanting to start out this year at 12%, uh, these numbers are not too bad. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's our recommendation. The insurance committee feels like that making the change to Coventry is what we need to do. I feel like financially it's, it's best for us and it's the same plans that we had before. Um, we, the board has uh, been here, our board paid plan has been, is what Coventry is calling plan number two. Uh, UHC called it uh, 7EL. I have no idea what any of that means. But uh, plan number two makes a lot more sense to me, and that's the one that uh, uh, would be our board paid plan, uh, would continue that. So, any questions, anybody? Joe with Wall Street will come and do a uh, sign up in April. 
explain everything to everybody. Uh, they'll get out new cards to everybody as quickly as possible. Um, so they'll, so they'll plan, be... Plan 2 is the one that is provided. Yes. And the others are upgrades if you wish to pay. And deductibles and co-pays are the same. Currently, uh, with the plan they're offering, everything's the same. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the plan structure is the same. And you can't be considering that it's not going up. Yeah. Well, well, just the, the very minimal. Yes. I think it's like two dollars yeah. uh, on the uh, plan two <coughs> for employees. So to the district, it's a very sure. very small uh, change. She said the dental and eyeglasses. The same. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, they they shopped out our um, vision and dental insurance, and uh, Guardian came in and said we'll keep you for another two years at the same exact rate with no increase. And we said, good, good enough, we'll take that. <laughs> so um, no increase there, so yes. So when does the plans go into effect? Um, plans so will go into effect July 1. Mm -hmm. okay. That's why they come and do sign-ups in April. We need to approve the attached health insurance proposal of country. The next is the TPCP courses A three nine. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Haney's show, and uh, I think you're going to use the screen. Yes, so if any of you all need to move, and I was re it was requested that we turn the lights down lower. So that the screen is more visible to the camera. Is that correct? Yes, please. Ooh. Okay, nobody, nobody needs to take a nap, though. Haney, you've got to be riveting, okay? No. I don't think I can guarantee that, but especially not in research based freshman. Do you need light to see? <laughs> nah. I'm mostly going to cover the high points there. Uh, Scott, if you would go ahead, please. <laughs> Basically, the objective of this proposal is to remove the technical prep and college prep designations from the current freshman level classes of physical science, English, one, and American government for students as they transition into high school. What I look at is a few years ago, we started a program for transitioning freshmen. We have freshman orientation. It's been a very successful, very productive program for us. And to me, this seems to be the next logical step uh, in that process of making the transition go a little better. And what we're going to do is we're going to hit some of the high notes of why we think we're struggling some with transition and why we think this will help. Okay? But I wanted to clear real quick, I want to make it very clear, we're only looking at freshmen. That's it. Um, there is a need to continue to offer college level and dual enrollment courses on the high school level. And as such, there's a need for differentiation of coursework based upon the complexity of curriculum. And I'm going to say this, within step five, one of the things we're looking at is the potential for IB or AP curriculum up top as well. So that need actually increases. So we, we're hoping that with a smoother transition, we can actually accelerate to a greater point later on. Scott? Timeline for consideration on this, you'll see it's been quite extensive. We first actually kicked it around about the spring of 2009. We looked at a lot of models and trying to decide what we really wanted to do with this. Then we released it as a discussion topic in the spring a year later. We kept it very quiet because, again, we didn't want everything going raucous. Because some of the ideas we kicked around early on, it was like the thousand attempts at making a light bulb. They were quite different. Um, and then we finally really settled on the need at the freshman level. So we released it in the spring of 2010. It kind of it got bounced around with a lot of approval. It was met by a little bit of opposition. Uh, so it was shelved for the time being, but in a discussion that we had with freshman teachers in November of last year, and some of them are represented here tonight with Ms. Steph and Ms. Kingery and Mr. Keeker. Ms. Rowland, who's been a huge player in this, unfortunately, is unable to be with us. But um, they really kind of came back and said, okay, it's time. We can see it, and it's time. So we reintroduced it January of this year in leadership in faculty meetings and in the bulletins. We wanted to make sure that every staff member knew what the consideration was, that we were addressing any and all concerns. And really, as far into the process as we've been with as many discussions as gone on, 
there wasn't really anything said. It was kind of a foregone conclusion by them. In January, I believe it's January, correct? Um, we did do eighth grade enrollment. It did not include TPCP offering. Part of that was we didn't want to muddy the waters. The other part was we wanted feedback from parents if they felt necessary. And really, to my knowledge, I spoke with one parent in regard to it. And actually, at the end of the day, it wasn't even TCP, TPCP that was that parent's issue. It was actually a science issue. We're very top heavy in science and coming up with a way to accelerate kids to get there is what her concern is and was. And we're actually working on that. It's a great idea. Um, it was passed by leadership with no objections in February. So you can see we've gone through an extensive timeline on this, Mr. Mercer. The key points, and here it is, a nine-year monitoring of this tells us that we have retained 135 freshmen. In all the other grades combined over that nine-year period, we retained 113. So think about that outpacing. One class alone outpaced all the others over a nine-year period. Okay. Um, Freshman students that were retained revealed that only 11 were back on track by the end of the sophomore year. And I want you to remember this information because as we get into a little bit more of the general data, this will become, to me, this is just sort of one of those aha moments. Mr. Mercer? Uh, we know from reading and research, and for those of you that could actually stay awake long enough to read the whole thing, the board packet, you'll know that we did some pretty extensive research on this. Um, the tracking reduces achievement of those who do not qualify for the high track. And that's one of those target groups we're trying to improve. Um, and that actually what we're currently doing tends to magnify the inequality. And we really think that part of the issue is we're doing that right out of the gate. I mean, these kids as eighth graders are being made to pick a track and where they're going into. And one of the other things I want to clear up, I don't have it in there, was sort of Something we tried this year, uh, last year, Dustin and I, and actually uh, John Boy Jr., who is not here tonight because of his coaching responsibilities, um, sat down and we looked at American government numbers. And American government had fewer CP kids than any of the other freshman classes. So we said, hey, you know what? Let's level the playing field. We just arbitrarily decided to add more CP American government. Why not? And what we found out of that? And correct me if I'm wrong, Dustin. Scores went up this semester because this of the semester, CPs. Yes, they did. And um, we didn't have any more failures, but yet arbitrarily we just added more sections and pushed kids more, and they responded just as you would expect to see them do and want them to. So that was sort of the thing about magnifying the inequality. We kind of looked at we do have an inequality, but it's almost in the namesake, and that scared us. Scott. Uh, a number of studies have concluded that students in high tracks encounter more challenging curriculum, move at a faster pace, and are taught by more experienced teachers. And see, to me, these are all key points because that last part, experienced teachers with better reputations, we have worked curta to curtail that. We don't really do that here, and I'm very proud of that. And I'll tell you, somebody that I'll give a hats off to is Dane Engelman. She has been an individual that has believed very much in teaching calculus, but also teaching like math lab. And she has kind of really brought that full circle with us, and I admire her a lot for that. And we actually, uh, now this year, will be smoothing out the last department where we had some of that inequity going on. So we really don't see the first part of that, but again, that was started why we started looking at what can we do to challenge our freshmen. While all students lower tracks encounter more fragmented, worksheet-oriented, and slower-paced instruction. So what we hope we will see is that by blending them, in that transition year, that we'll be able to better challenge all students. We'll be able to bring to the board that kind of CP philosophy that research tells us exists in those side tracks. What do we expect? Often districts are able to demonstrate that high achievers were doing as well or better than before. One of the best quotes I heard in all of this is, high achieving students will achieve. They will challenge themselves. They make it that point. That's who they are, it's in their nature. You're not going to discredit them, and that research shows that. And we hope that we'll eliminate the belief in transition that lower track students choose low track classes because they require less work. I hear that a lot, that idea, I, I don't want to be in CP, why not? Well, I can't handle it. Well, why not? Why can't you? And the problem is they're being made to pick before they ever get here, and we can test them on this level. 
and we can make those recommendations and we can look at how good they are. And I can tell you, if there's one thing that really frustrates me, it's that right there. When I've got a kid in TP who's picked in TP, coming into here, is in TP, and I know they should be CP, and I beat my head against the wall trying to do that. So again, why just ninth grade? What research shows us is that that transition year with relationship stresses, adolescent transition stresses, and overall high track and general education students alike, rated academic requirements is the most pressing. And keep in mind, the freshman year is the first year. They really see academic requirements as far as credits needed to progress and not just age or general passing of classes. One of the most compelling reasons for focusing on ninth grade is the evidence of getting off track. And here's where I want to tie back to that data we talked about earlier. Of the graduation plan has negative long-term educational consequences. Keep in mind, getting off track as freshmen, and we have 135 of them off track, Mr. Mercer. More students fell ninth grade than any other. I thought that was interesting because our data showed that in-house, and there's <coughs> national data telling us the same thing. And here you go. A third of all students who entered ninth grade cited failing school their freshman year as a major factor for dropping out. So basically we'd have in the 40s of our students over that nine year period that would cite failing freshmen right out of the gate as being the reason that they, and these are just things of why we kind of believe our current system isn't working. And then we'd like to try this, I mean it's right here, it just seems evident to us, Scott. Um, four theories that greatly impact student transitional success. These are all things we have and we can't do anything about. So we're going to, we want to take advantage of the things we can. Day-to-day -day life course changes, transition to a new school, adequate preparation for high school, the high school organizational climate. Now I will say something about number three when it comes to adequate preparation. I do feel like our kids come adequately prepared for what they bring, but I think the problem is we don't have the segregation down in middle school, we shouldn't. But now in that transition year, they're being made to transition to high school, they're being made to pick a path, and sometimes it's a very prejudiced choice because I hear parents all the time, well, he's got to be in CP because he's going to college. Well, we've got 60% of our kids, I'm proud to say, go to college, we don't have 60% of our kids in all CP classes. Kids in TP go to college. We want to up that level in that freshman year and kind of smooth out the playing field. Scott? <coughs> Standardized test scores and dropout rates have suggested and researchers have confirmed that the middle to high school transition is a key point in the academic, social, and emotional trajectory of students across the country. Okay? So it just, all this research is, just keeps telling us the same thing. Scott? Implementation. Now this is kind of where it's a little weak admitted. Phase one, we would like you guys to approve removing TPCP designation for those three classes. Phase two, we didn't really want to put the cart before the horse, but we'll uh, committee to address standards for enrollment, maintenance, and CP classes. That maintenance has been a big issue with the staff and the communication because it's something we haven't had before. It will minimum grade point to stay in CP classes as they move up the ladder. And those are really the three key points there, teacher recommendation, minimum grade, and an appeals process, meaning if the teacher doesn't recommend you and you want in, a sort of point system which you can earn your way in. Um, we believe that's critical. And it seems like those three things and all the discussion are pretty much so phase two, but we haven't solidified the point process yet. Because, again, we were going to put a lot of time and energy into that if phase one was going to be unsuccessful. But I would say that we'd be able to come back to you in uh, April or May before this year even ends with the completed phase two. Evaluation of the plan, obviously student retention rates for freshmen, without a doubt. EOC state standardized tests for all scores or benchmark data because unfortunately we do not collect um, EOC scores in physical science. So we'd have to look at benchmark data as it's said. And then the graduation rate. Um, and then one of the things that the Basically, the state now is implementing in teacher evaluations, administrator evaluations, and it's just a great thing. We've been using a lot more of the building since we've been able to go one-to-one -one and collect data quicker, more efficiently, is student surveys. Ask the students themselves after a year, so forth, so on, how they felt, what they felt, the whole nine yards. Follow that track through, making sure that we did prepare them for the CP level classes or something. Final thought. 
and this is kind of appropriate coming off the lip that we did last week, we wish to gain a more positive school climate and culture by starting students off together in their coursework and not segregating them within the first year of high school. Okay. Questions? Mr. Mack, I think we could do the lights if you want. Did I leave anything out, guys? I asked Mr. Haney to encourage some of the teachers to come. If you guys had questions or if you guys have comments, uh, this would be a great time. Is this something that, I mean, elementary years ago, track kids, right? And that's gone by and has been better. Well, uh, yeah, we, we don't do, you know, bluebirds and cardinals and crows anymore. Uh, we do have... Uh, I don't have <laughs> <laughs> We do have flexible grouping based on uh, assessed need. And, that, you know, that in reading is especially right. successful strategy. You know, they, they do some assessment and they divide them up in groups and they really target and work on a certain skill that a group of kids needs help with. And they do that for... A, X number of weeks and then they test again and if they don't need that anymore then they move on to something else. So it's it's a lot different than what we used to think of as, you know, the, the reading groups or the, the math groups or whatever. Um, so yeah, we, we have, I think we've learned and what, what uh, research has showed us is that when you group kids like that, number one, the top group is going to excel no matter what. They're, they're going to achieve. The middle group, uh, if you have a middle group, they're, they're not going to do as well. They're, but what really happens is that bottom group falls further and further and further behind. You would think, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive to think that, but because you would think, well, if you put them together and you really focused on the, the things that they needed and, and, you know, you put it, it seems to make sense to do it that way, but really it doesn't happen. The, you give them a lesser curriculum because you think their abilities are less and oftentimes it, it is that you, you give a less able teacher that group, you know, the, the really challenging class you, you give to the, the star teacher a lot of the time and um, it, it just serves to cause this bottom group to further and further fall behind. That's really the, the logic and the, the research behind co-teaching. It's, it's the same kind of mindset. If you pull those special education students out into segregated courses with, with a, a reduced expectation, they never catch up. And then you test them on the same grade level stuff, well, they've not even experienced this curriculum. They've been over here in a, in a reduced way. And so when you blend them together, it gives role models. It gives uh, peer coaching opportunities that can't happen when you don't have anybody in the group who gets it. Then you don't have anybody who can explain it in kid language to other kids. Um, so you, you need that blending of abilities. And as I said, that's, that's the mindset behind co-teaching that we have seen be so successful with our special education students in improving their scores and their abilities. So it's that same philosophy that, and, and if you remember, this is kind of a side note, when we did the staff climate survey early on, this was one of the things that came up actually pretty frequently as being something that was very dissatisfying to, I think, probably staff who are parents of students who've experienced the, in the eighth grade, you've got to figure out what you want to do and whether or not you're going to be in CP classes or TP classes and, you know, um, they find it a bit overwhelming and they also, as, as Mr. Haney said, they, they feel segregated. You know, oh, I didn't qualify for CP classes, or I didn't get teacher recommendation in the eighth grade to go into CP classes. Um, There's a stigma. Yeah, yeah. When I first started teaching in the achievement test, you were participating by Joe, that said they gave the achievement test at the end of the year, mm -hmm. 75 students, top 25 go to the high level, 
next 25 middle level, next 25 to low level. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of a stigma. A lot of times the same kids stay in that same level all the way through, and they have, they, we're, we're in a dumb room. Mm -hmm. right? no. and, and they got further behind, yeah. rather than ever catching up or improving, that it just got worse and worse and worse. And so uh, I think that research bears us out that this is a, a worthy thing to try. And um, over the last few years, we've kind of taken the philosophy that when we see something that isn't working or that is a problem, we research and try to try some of the things that we see that research says. We don't know that this is a perfect answer. It's probably not a silver bullet, but I think it will. I think it's a worthy thing to try to to uh, attack that problem of 135 freshmen uh, being held back, um, and that's more than all of the others put together over nine years. Sounds like they're also. I mean, one of our nothing's been bad, but our opportunities have been government scores that it could bring those numbers along to. That's, I think that's uh, very much one of the points that they've talked about. So. I did have a parent talk to me about this. I kind of think it might be the same one that talked with Mr. Heaney, but, um, I, and I tried to explain, I don't think that we're taking anything away from the college, the CP kids, because it's not that we're lessening the instruction for anyone is we're hoping to raise the instruction for other kids. Mm -hmm. I think those and yeah, just to speak, um, Mrs. Kinger and I work with the freshmen at the English level in the English courses and uh, they the the attempts at differentiation are so hard because you don't have like her classes or the T P classes, she doesn't have that strength. Mm -hmm. And the higher level kids and we've seen it kind of in school spirit. You've all seen the school spirit just blossom because those kids um, at the senior level now took it on and made it their own and made it cool and fun and exciting. And those CP kids get to do that. You know, they get to be that inspiration, that guiding source, that motivation for these lower level kids that they wouldn't have normally worked with. And I know as a teacher, that's part of what inspires me to keep going. That's what inspires you guys to be on the board is seeing people excel mm -hmm. and so that push could really make a difference in their attitude and their ability to learn and that's what we want to see we want to see that excitement back mm -hmm. in that TP level and so it's not taken away and the level will go actually from TP to CP <coughs> all of the things that I normally do in my CP class they will be doing across the board in the TP classrooms and, and if we remove that it doesn't affect the graduation certificates that we know that that would, you know, the the state doesn't issue those anymore right. anyway. That's totally it's within our, our yeah. school district, and um, so if we determine that there needs to be a revision of that, which sometimes we have to do based on state requirements and a variety of other things anyway, um, then we can make that change. That's completely under our discretion. We talked about phase two, and we talked about the points and all that. There still could be parent input if need be. Yeah. I, I would think that could be a part of the process, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the good news is at that stage of the game we would have that coursework and stuff on the um, high school level that the parent could use as defense for, hey, look, you know, my child earned this grade and did this and really, you know, so I really see that as a key. We don't want to keep anybody out as a big thing. We just want I think a clear picture of what to expect because we also know as we move to AP and IB and stuff like that, like I said, I know that there are some kids that I'd love to have in CP that I think the choice was made too early for them not to be. Um, and they weren't mature. You know, that's the other thing that we have to remember. I see the maturity level, and I know these people will tell you point blank, that between freshman and sophomore and sophomore to junior is where they really mature. And so it's one of those where you've got kids that weren't ready as freshmen that very well will be ready going into their sophomore. And we're letting them have a little bit more time to develop themselves as students in and, an environment where it's more enthusiastic and encouraging. And I know in my conversation with uh, John Boyd with the American government kids, there are a number of kids in TP classes that we feel now would be prepared in their sophomore or junior year to take a CP class and would catch a lot of those kids that Again, as Mr. Haney's pointed out, it's that level of maturity maybe at the 8th grade level. Maybe their grades weren't as high, but based on their EOC scores, based on what we see on their benchmark assessments, 
they seem to be successful and need to be in that CP class at a sophomore or junior level. But they're almost stigmatized now. Yeah. To, well, I was in TP and it's easy. I, I couldn't do that in CP. Yeah. To where you give them the general pool and you let staff encourage them and you know, give it a shot. What yeah. do you have to lose? The semester if it doesn't work, come out. And that's really what we see. Well, the great thing about this is that you recognized, or you recognized it and it was talking and trying to do something about it. That's great. Thank you. That's a good idea. Move to approve the removal of CP or TP designation in grade 9 courses. Second. the motion and second. All in favor, motion and aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we'll move on to dissertation and project approval. <laughs> Ms. Fleek is <coughs> tickled that she is at this point, <laughs> um, and, and I will let her talk about her project, but uh, the long and short is that, that her university requires that you all approve uh, the research being done in your buildings. So, Julie, you want to give them a heads up on what's going on? Sure. Um, when I became building principal at the middle school, I noticed there was a lot of students that seemed to just continue to fail and struggle and didn't really have any support you know, other than the counselor checking on them every once in a while. So I came up with a program, and for lack of a better name, I still can't think of a good name for it, I just call it a student watch program. And the criteria to get into the program, we watch their grades first and second uh, quarter, and then semester I take and have Donna print me an F list for all grades, six, seven, and eight. And any student who fails two or more classes we pull into the program. And what we do with them at the beginning of second semester is we start meeting with them weekly. I meet with them, uh, the assistant principal, and then my two counselors. We rotate them around. And we sit down with them every week. Uh, we talk about missing work, late work, uh, track their GPA to show them, you know, you missed these two assignments and look what it did to your math grade. Um, look at their planners, try to keep help them keep organized. I don't know how many backpacks I've cleaned out. <laughs> um, but it's just a program to show them that somebody cares and that we're watching what they're doing. Um, so this is my fourth year implementing the program and what I would like to do is use on-the-shelf data in the form of their grades as a group. I'm not going to use any student names. I'm not going to identify indi any individual student. It will always be as a group. Um, and I'm going to analyze those grades over a four-year period, you know, my first group, my second group, my third group, and uh, just see if it did have an impact and if it's continuing to have an impact. And so I would like to do that. And then I'm also going to survey my teachers to see if they have seen any changes in their classroom behavior while they're in the program. And a few other things here and there as they come up in my head as I work on this. So. I'm at the point where, um, with your approval tonight, I can turn in my, it's called an IRB form, an International Review Board form, to Missouri Baptist to get their approval to start collecting the data. I'm working on the last two chapters of this thing. <laughs> so, do you okay. have any questions for me? I, just, I think I've got three. Okay. So this is, the, this is not something new. It's something that you already have data, it's something that you've already done. Yes. Uh, and you're just going to, I assume, use the students from the past four years and the upcoming years to crunch the numbers, shall we say. Yes. It, it's nothing It's nothing new. It's, it's nothing actually, new. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I, I'm, I guess one of the things I've got you, in the, on the second page, in the second paragraph, there's an excellent uh, explanation of uh, not being identified by name under any circumstances whatsoever the course of this research study or any publication thereof. The, I think the FERPA thing is covered coming and going. But my, I guess my paranoia is on something like this that uses their, their data, although you've got it coded, is mm -hmm. would it be necessary to have parental permission forms or permission from the parents? Or is that something because it's coded that it's all right? Well, what I think I have to do, and if this is wrong, I'll come back to you. But I'm going, in, in my paper I said I'm going to send a letter to the parents to tell them that I'm going to use their child's data. And if they don't want me to, they can opt out. Um, but since I'm not directly interviewing the child and using that individual information, I don't think I have to have parent permission to 
really do that, but I feel like it's important that I go ahead and address it and tell them that I'm going to, that I would like to use the data. Do you know where I got that question from? Missouri Baptist University. Do you, did you bump in that before? I think I've paid them a lot of money oh. <laughs> <laughs> over the past few years, but yes. And, and just, just, just quickly again, because uh, it sounds uh, very interesting to me, this, this program. Define it again. The effect of student watch intervention program. Because I wasn't here when it was going on, so. Yeah. So you want me to go through what it oh, is? Oh, no, no. Just, yeah, very briefly. Um, okay. What I do is I look at first quarter grades, and then I look at second quarter grades, and then I have Donna, as secretary, print an F list with all of the semester grades. And then I, I look for those students that I've kind of identified first and second quarter as failing and see if they fall into that category of failing two or more cl classes. And then I pull them into the program, and uh, we begin meeting with them. And is this all six, seven, and eight are? Mm -hmm. gotcha. And um, over the years, as we've gone through, you know, you get a month or two into it, you have another group that you see starting to fail. So if you go back and look at their first and second quarter grades, you see, well, there's a slight pattern there. You know, something may have happened, so we, I go ahead and I pull that in, too. Just because, you know, it, it's a support system, anything that's going to help the kids. And if it's going to help the kids, then I'm going to pull them in and work with them. So I think right now I have 33 identified. I think the most I've ever had is 45. Across all three grades? Across all three grades. And that's looking at the two or more failures. So. What would be the difference of what you're proposing than what you're doing now? Is there a big difference? No, it's no. what I'm doing. I'm it's just what you're doing already. Yes. Oh, okay. It's what I'm doing already. Okay. But this needs your permission to, to use it. To oh, use okay. the research. Oh, okay. Right. That's it. Okay. And then, you know, the yeah. whole point of my project is to just determine if this, if this is an effective practice and it should continue. And if it's proven effective, then we'll continue it. And if not, We'll look at some other program and try to come up with a new idea. That sounds great. So I'll move to approve Ms. Julie Fleet's research project involving the St. Genevieve Middle School Student Watch Program. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion. <coughs> I move that the Board of Education hold a closed meeting with a closed record, closed vote following the regular open meeting on April 15, 2013, to be held in the R. W. Thomas Library, 715 Washington Street, St. James, Missouri, for the purpose of discussing and voting upon the following items of business. Legal action, causes of action, or litigation. Lease, purchase, or sale of real estate. Hiring, firing, disciplining, or promoting particular employees. Scholastic probation, expulsion, or graduation of identifiable individuals. Testing and examination materials. Preparation for negotiations with employee groups. Specifications for competitive bidding until approved or published. Sealed bids and related documents until the bids are open. Sealed proposals and related documents until all proposals are rejected. Or any documents related to a negotiated contract until a contract is executed. Individually identifiable personnel records, performance ratings, or records pertaining to employees or applicants for employment. Records protected from disclosure by law. Records relating to municipal hotlines established for the reporting of abuse and wrongdoing. Confidential or privileged communication with an auditor. Existing or proposed security systems and st structural plans of district property. Records that identify and would allow unauthorized access to or unlawful disruption of the configuration of components or the operation of the computer, computer system, computer network, or telecommunications network. Credit card numbers, personal identification numbers, digital certificates, physical and virtual keys, access codes, or authorization of codes that are used to protect electronic transactions. I further move that notice to this meeting and attend the agenda be posted as agenda be posted as required by law. A vote from the second roll call. Eric Walter? Yes. David Bova? Yes. Charlie Crowther? Yes. Joan Dunley? Yes. Jim Kirchner? Yes. Carrie McDaniel? Yes. Martha Reesinger? Yes. Motion carried 7 0. Move to go to the closed session with a closed record and closed vote after a short frame. Second. The motion and second. All the by saying aye. 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 Aye